Hello, everybody. Hello. We're here to hack you for your benefit. We have here a most amazing hacker in France, a most amazing director of product security in Jesse. And Jesse, a first question to you. If you are a startup, a new startup, maybe you have five employees, maybe 10, maybe 15, should cybersecurity be a concern for you? Should you do something? Or, or is it OK to ignore it? Yeah, so I, I think from the get-go, right, whether you're a small company or a large company, you know, one founder or five, you need to start thinking about security from the very beginning. So build a culture um, from day one that everybody in the team knows that security is important, right? You don't need to be a security person to know that security is important. You, we say this, but if you have a, a startup with 10 people, 10 good friends who've started, and nobody knows what cybersecurity is or how it is spelled, how do you get going? Where do you start? Yeah, so I think by making security like a core value of your company, I think it's going to encourage people to take that extra you know, 30 minutes to research how to, the best practices about how to build things and how to make things secure. Um, and that will pay dividends. You, you know, the hack may be three years later that you prevented, but it'll pay off if you take care of that now. So it just takes a lot of research and, and reach out to the community. The security community is great. You can reach out and ask people for help. We're all in this together. Franz, you've hacked every company yeah. in this planet, meaning found ways to yeah. break in, and then you report the vulnerabilities to them. What do startups look to, like to you? Do they look secure? I think what Jesse says regarding like thinking about security in the beginning, uh, as you're building up the company, I think that has been a um, clear sign that not all of the startups have done that from the start. Meaning, basically, you can find some, sometimes even down to like how they designed their app or how they con constructed like how it's supposed to work is actually wrong from 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 the start. So it's actually like developed wrong in the beginning. So I think um, most of the time when approaching startups you kind of see um, some of the very simple and easy um, vulnerabilities being there. Um, and it could be all from like exposing credentials on GitHub. It's like a super, super easy way to expose some internal app or, or whatever, just because people didn't think of not committing Co like credentials to your source code. And, and so, so let's be specific. When you say exposing credentials, yeah. you mean somebody wrote soft software code where they wrote out the password yeah, in exactly. plain language yeah. in the code? Yeah, exactly. And, and maybe open sourced it or made it public and then yeah. accidentally have those credentials in that. It's a super common thing. And you can, you can see that often in teams where you didn't have like a uh, a, a structure around talking around security or how you should do like the best practices around how to keep stuff safe. Yeah. So I think I think that's a, that's a common mistake for for startups. Also, when it comes to um, like how to store data or like how to actually retrieve data regarding multiple customers or there, there's a lot of like. Um, patterns you can see with startups when it's all about like building as fast as possible uh, getting it out there as fast as possible so I think what as like like I said like, like Jesse said like focus on talking around security make security fun like I, I think that's a core uh, point you need to th like try to figure out like if it's about sending your developers to a security conference yeah uh, paying for that or 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 taking a security person to come talk with your developing team, it doesn't matter. It's just about like getting it in there, into the discussion, some parts into the sprint, and like make it fun, make it a part of the, of the building process. But don't you now sound like a dentist who will say, make it fun to go to the dentist? I mean, sure, but it's, it's, it is fun. Like when I, I, like I sit in actually three, Chairs here. I should have no. Um, no yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, so I'm 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 partly like doing hacking for companies, 
also I, I build startups. Uh, I create a bunch of startups, so uh, without security people um, at all. And then I'm, I'm doing talks together with developing teams. So I meet developer, team, developer teams and try to engage them in security. And every time you go and speak with developers and you talk around security, you notice you have like two or three people that is like, you can see their eyes shine up and you see like the glimmering lights in their eyes. And you realize that there's a lot of people in these companies that actually think of security, read about security, thinks it's actually super interesting, but they maybe don't have the, the tools in that company to actually show their capabilities or their their uh, uh, properties. Uh, properties. So that's what you work with, Jesse, because you are director of product security. So you go and talk to your software engineers and say, please, please, please be mindful of security aspects. Is yeah, that yeah. So my goal is, is to be their asset, right? To work for yeah. them and make sure that they're doing everything that they can and answer any questions they have to build these products securely. So and how, how do you make it fun for them, like Franz said? Yeah, so um, you can do that in various ways. You can have you know, internal capture the flag uh, assessments yeah. that you can get people really excited about. Um, have them try to break into things, right? And then also, you know, when you have like penetration assessments and stuff like that as your company grows, um, work with the developers and show them how the hackers could actually get in, right? Let them read those reports and be transparent because um, that's going to energize them about how to fix these things and be proactive. So like when you think of hackers, you think of a like very complex set of tools that they've built that could just break into anything. But a lot of times, it's the most basic things that you have in your organization that can actually defend these, right? So before you start building any kind of product, go to the whiteboard, draw it out, figure out how things are connected together. That's like one of the biggest mistakes startups make is they just start deploying. Um, and they don't understand what data touches what and what yeah. things are on the perimeter. So go to the whiteboard, think through it. Have your developers write up RFCs that talk about the features that they're building and how, th how it's going to be used by the customers. Yeah. And then write security considerations into that. So it's like instant threat modeling by the people that are actually going to be building these features for your product company. So then when they make a mistake and you have a security vulnerability or a weakness in your software, how do you avoid it becoming an issue of pride and shame, and how do you avoid the shaming of the one guilty? Yeah, I, th I think by, by having that core value of security from the leadership at the top, the developer is going to be OK taking the time and acknowledging there's an issue, because I know my leadership team would want that fixed, right? That's going to be a priority over new yeah. feature work. I think you can also put the, the, the like the point where like what was actually fixed and how will you make sure this will never happen again like if you put the focus more on like not not who to blame but more on like this is what we actually did like how did you actually how did you figure it out and how did you like follow the the process of like identifying what was if if something was leaked what was leaked how did it happen when did it occur and then like how how can we build something that actually prevents this from happening ever again like if you f if you put your focus as like the leader leadership in the company if you put your focus more towards those things than to who to blame i think that will also create like a better environment to get people to raise the flag and say i found a vulnerability like if you can get your team to actually go to you and say I found a vulnerability, this is what I did, uh, and this is what we need to do, that's like the, the perfect case. Then you know you have a, a pretty good uh, environment when it comes to being transparent internally about issues. Yeah, make it fun. I mean, it, have your if, if somebody finds a vulnerability, right? Have them do a show and tell. Get up in front of the yeah. company. Show them the, the cool hack that they found, the knowledge right? Knowledge sharing, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now people are getting exciting about this. They're going to do all this security stuff. Yeah. But you said you must have the top management to approve and bless and endorse it. How do you do that if you are an engineering manager here? How do you get your CEO to take security seriously when it is a cost item and not a revenue opportunity? Yeah, I mean, I mean, one hack can ruin a company, right? And I think that's powerful and, and enough that a CEO should recognize that this is important. This should be top priority. Even in a startup. Yeah, and, and your developers, your engineering team, your infrastructure, they're all going to need your support going through this. Yeah, yeah. So how would, you, how would you go to a CEO and say, dear CEO, I would like to influence you on this topic? What would you say? I mean, it's hard to put a kind of a ROI on security, right? Because it's, it's a, 
It's an interesting topic because, you know, a vulnerability that's introduced today may not impact you for 10 years from now, right? When you realize that you left some dev instance or database exposed on the internet from when the company was founded, right? Um, so it's really hard to wrap a number around that. Um, so I think you need to, to show them examples of other companies yeah. and, and breaches that have happened, show them evidence. And then uh, CEOs are thinking about compliance too, and that plays a piece of it, right? Um, we're, we're all in charge of keeping the company yeah. responsible uh, for other people's data, so yeah. compliance plays a big piece in it. But, but when you look at, sorry, for yeah, no, but sorry. when you look at the breaches, most breaches are with big companies, like we had Equifax and we had others, and it's not startups. So how, maybe yeah. a startup here will think, oh, we are not at risk. So that's, that that's interesting, and this is something that's becoming more popular, right? Because yeah, you may be a startup and you have this small product, but you're more than likely leaning on these other large companies that are having these breaches. You know, if it's a Facebook, a Google, whatever it may be, right? You've probably implemented some third party feature within your code base to make your product more robust, and now you've got to worry about not only your company, but that other company as well. Yeah. Absolutely. I think um, what I was, uh, I actually dropped the, <laughs> no, but uh, what, what I was thinking ar around like how to convince your CEO, it's more on like we had the discussion before uh, outside, like being more secure than your peers and your competitors. I think that's also one of the, because nowadays I see it uh, like when, when companies approach us trying to buy our service or not only Detectify but the other startups I'm involved in, uh, security comes up as an argument or a question at least. Like how do you work with security? How do you implement, uh, like how do you do patching? How do you announce if you had a vulnerability? And like uh, customers tend to be more and more interested in how, to, uh, how you're actually working with security. And I see it myself whenever I I'm going to use third parties, I ask them, like, how do you have a responsible disclosure policy? Are people from the outside able to actually contact your security team and tell you about vulnerabilities in your product? And if they say no, I'm, I'm more reluctant into picking them as a, as a vendor. And, and I think also trying to communicate, I think the CEO might have seen those things when customers approach them, seen the things and the questions around security. So coming from the CTO perspective to the CEO, telling them that we can actually be um, better at this than our, our competitors and we, we have an option here to, uh, to actually make a stance in terms of security. I think that's a, that's a valid argument towards the CEO as well. Okay, I'll have another objection for you to deal with then. Um, Somebody might say, okay, we're talking software vulnerabilities and putting the systems in shape, and then say, but the, we the weak link is always the human being, the criminal or the gullible employee who clicks on a phishing link, or maybe even an, uh, a person inside who is intentionally doing harm. So why would you care about software vulnerabilities if humans still are the big biggest risk? Yeah. They're always gonna take the easiest path. It's, it's all about that. So if the easiest path is through a, a, like a software, they will take that path. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that like humans is, is one of the easy paths nowadays because it's, uh, there's such, so much noise in that channel anyway. Uh, but a lot of people are trying to, like, there's like free tools today to make like fake phishing emails to your employees, to make them, to make at least the discussion start uh, internally around like, why are you giving out the Google credentials to a uh, third party? And like all these 2FA things and, and the multi-factor authentication is, is like one step in the proper direction, I think. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I I kind of feel the same way. Like e every time I sit in the hack and I'm like, okay, the easiest way to hack this company is probably to send an email to customer support. And I'm like, why am I doing this? Uh, so, so if someone has to answer to that question, I'm happy to listen as well. But I think it's like, it's all about like trying to eliminate your, your, the, your threats basically. And, and how do you deal it. with it, Jesse? I mean, yeah, you probably. So at Lifeomic, we kind of take a, a layered approach, right? So we make sure that we have multiple layers of security yeah. controls in place, like two-factor authentication, right? So if a password is breached or a laptop is, is stolen, right, we don't have to worry about it because there's multiple layers protecting that data. Yeah. And those are, those are usually as, as easy as, as flipping a switch or you know, paying a small monthly fee yeah. to add an extra service. And it's, it's worth the cost up front, especially for a small startup, right? Because then you're gonna prevent things that can impact you down the road. 
And do you do phishing uh, training for your employees? Do you send out those? Yeah, we do. Fake we do some internal phish. testing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we also use Okta to help prevent any kind of secondary attack to that. So. Right. Yeah. How do you deal, both of you, with people who are not from the security or the technical space? Like, there's a lot of marketing people, salespeople, administrative people who need to have a security understanding, but they don't have the technical background that you guys have. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, so I, I think it's especially point, important for them to understand, right? Because they're the ones that are going out there and talking to customers, and they're going to get asked these hard questions way before the security team does, right? That sit in the back. So they need to have a good understanding of how the system works and how we're preventing things, right? So your security team or you know, your, your core engineers need to tell them, here are the things we've done to protect data so they can go out and, and tell their customers um, how it works. And, and the customers are going to show them that that's important. And hopefully they'll bring that back in-house and realize that it's important for them as well. I think it comes down to what Jesse says, like the knowledge sharing, super important. We also made like security sheet sheets internally, so we can like answer the most common like FAQ for, for security issues, and then also try to get feedback from the, like if the sales team are out and they, like we got the question around this, like how are we solving this? We try to keep that document updated so it's always relevant to the, the things that we're doing and currently are working on. Yeah, and one interesting thing that we do at Lifeomic is all of our security policies that all employees must follow, we put those right in Bitbucket, right? So the employees themselves can collaborate and communicate on those. It's not some random PDF shoved in a drive somewhere. Yeah. It's something that everybody can chime in and say, hey, this doesn't make sense, or yeah, I really like this, yeah. and give feedback. So they're going to be more apt to actually follow those yeah. policies. Yeah, I agree. So now we have, we have endpoint protection, we have encryption, we have uh, vulnerability management, we have a lot of security technologies that people need to use. If you're a startup and you're just shipping product and you can afford just one thing in security, wh what's the minimum you can do? What, what can you postpone? because you can't do all at once. I, I think two-factor authentication out of the box is... You'd start there. Yeah. yeah. And also thinking, like if you're a startup, you're also thinking about scaling. Um, and I think when it comes to scaling, you also need to think about what your investments will be today and what your investments are going to be in two or three years. So if you think that um, not putting the, the like, finding a person that actually are, is dedicated internally around security. It could be your developer, it could be your CTO, it could be the CEO, uh, for, for all I know. So it's it, having someone that actually has that in mind from start, I think it's, it's really valuable. There was a discussion before around like creating a startup without having any tech people in the company, and people are like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> and it comes, it's, uh, I'm not saying you should have that in the board or like have it from the initial start. It helps, but I think you could probably find that, uh, that skill or that, that interest in people in your team, even though you're only four or five people. Excellent answer. This was actually a question for the, from the audience, so please uh, submit your questions through Slido. I will ask them here. And while you do that, I'll ask you to, to share some amazing cybersecurity story, either a horror story or a joyful story of something you experienced. And uh, we'll start with Jesse and then go to France. Okay, um, yeah, so I was working with a small team doing a security assessment, and it was a startup. They had had a lot of turnover within their product. Um, a, a lot of engineers had left. They had you know, tried outsourcing, that kind of thing, and I was doing an assessment, and I actually found that they had chained together a bunch of EC2 instances and databases in the back end, and just things were all over the place, and they didn't realize it. Um, and I was able to text in a malicious payload and get it to execute against the administrator on their portal and steal their credentials. So it was using a, a text message. Yes, all via a text <laughs> message. Something you would definitely not expect, right? You don't really think about that whenever you're thinking about attacks. But these are the things that you got to think about uh, whenever you're designing your architecture. Did they love you or hate you for uh, it? They were pretty impressed. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good uh, reaction, I think. Franz. So I I, I thought of of a. Uh, a scenario that was actually one of my startups I was involved in for like seven years ago. This was like pre-bug bounty, so it was 
pre-Hacker One even. And um, we, we knew that we had a bunch of SQL injection problems in our app. We knew that from start. So what we did was not to try to find all the like, SQL injections. Instead, we, know, we knew that a, as soon as someone will try to make a SQL injection, they will at some point trigger a SQL error. So what we did was we made sure that all the errors that was triggered by the app when someone tried to hack it would escalate into a, a channel in our chat software. It was like pre-Slack even, and, and alerts like a, a few of us. Uh, so we knew that someone was actually successfully exploiting a SQL injection. And this happened on a Saturday. And we, um, I saw it on my cell phone. And I like, went in. I patched it uh, in like less than 10 minutes. And I could see the person was trying to like try it again, but he couldn't. Like he was like, "What the hell? Why is this not working?" And I was like, "Okay, someone is trying to hack us. Who can this be?" And we had two employees in the company that I knew was like a bit hackery. Um, and they were also the people starting Detectify after that. But they had a friend. Uh, that was in Amsterdam, and I saw the IP was in Amsterdam. Uh, so I told them, like, do you know if this is like your friend? Like, it, it seems suspicious. So they went to him the day after, and like, did you did you uh, uh, like look for vulnerabilities here? And he was like, yeah, like, <laughs> uh, but it disappeared on a Saturday. What is this? Uh, so then we knew who it was. So we bought him a plane ticket and flew him to Sweden, and he he spent the Christmas with us, and he's now a really close friend. So that was a fun, like, a good uh, ending story of. Uh, uh, of uh, hacking and a bug bounty, plane ticket bug bounty, pre bug bounties ever. That's a beautiful story. Okay. We have somebody asking here, could you please share some tips on, on sorry, uh, what's the best way to hack a company? How do you normally proceed? So, Franz, you hack companies. How do you uh, do yeah. uh, I, I, I start off by looking at all exposable assets from my perspective. Often I get I don't get any internal access or credentials or anything. I get the same thing as, um, I don't know, Russian, <laughs> Russian hacker would get. Um, not to say that they hack more. but uh, So I would look at what's exposed. Do they have any internal assets exposed? Do they, maybe they have like company.com. Maybe they have like company.net with all their internal infrastructure. Looking at their DNS, how it's structured. Maybe now, they have a bunch of. Now when you say look, what yeah. do you mean by look? I, I, I search, yeah, I search. Or you use a tool? There's a bunch of tools. There's a bunch of services that actually tries to create a recon process out of figuring out where the company is exposed, like what kind of services they use, uh, do they have any open source, and l l just l trying to collect all the assets out there to try to see how much I can get, and then go into detail, basically. Yeah, I, similar process, right? I use open source tools to go out and just see what's there, yeah. look for any potential vulnerable software that's, that's running on these services, any open ports, that kind of thing, and just start poking around. Um, a lot of times, too, I'll go out and if it, let's say it's a website, right, a banking website, I'll go out and pretend like I'm a standard user and start thinking about where that sensitive data is, right? And then I know that's probably where I want to try to get to first. I'm not going to waste my time looking at the other areas. Yeah. And, and what's, what's the most typical first bug you find, first vulnerability when you, when you find it? That oh, you... goodness. I think it depends on the asset. Um, There's no typical one. Yeah, like, well, so one thing that I, I really like to do is to see if they've exposed their Git repository at the root of the site, um, because that has their source code. And if you can yeah. get to their source code, a lot of times you can find credentials. Um, you can also see how the site's operating, even if it doesn't have credentials. And you can look for deeper vulnerabilities that you can exploit. I tend to look a lot around like infrastructure. Where are they hosting it? Are they running it on AWS or GCP or Azure or, or similar? Because if you know that, you might also know where to look, what to look for next. And how do you know? So basically, let's say they use AWS for stuff. Then you can probably think, OK, they're probably using one service in AWS called S3, which is like storage, um, bucket storage. And or object storage, you can basically store as m much as you want in one place. Uh, so you would probably assume that they're using that as well in their in their service. And like, look more into like what kind of infrastructure. How how did they create this app? How was this app? Do they have load balancers in the way? And how's that load balancer configured? And I, I mostly don't look at how the app actually works until later on when I know how the app was constructed and and put online. 
from the start. I want to know that first because that helps me a lot into moving forward. So we talk about security hackers who break into systems and we talk about software developers who build systems. And then some people say that the best developers also know how to break it and the best breakers, the best hackers also know how to build it. Is that true? Is that, I, is I think it's, a, it's abso absolutely a benefit. Uh, I come from the developer perspective. I was a developer uh, from, from the start. So me approaching security with a developer perspective was really valuable for me because both I could be a better software engineer and build stuff better because I knew why I was building security mitigations, but also I knew where to look in other applications because I was like, this is a hard thing to solve. I will see how they solved it. And sometimes it turned out to them not solving it at all, and that was the vulnerability I found. So I, 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 I really think it's a, it's a valuable asset, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you're a developer, you obviously know how to build, you know, you know where the risks are at and what things can be skipped over, what corners can be cut, and, and those developers that, that know that, they can make some of the very best security team members. So when you're looking to start building out a security team, you could recruit some of your own internal engineers that are really passionate yeah. about security along the way. Yeah, that leads to the question of, should the startup have a dedicated security manager or like you are director of product security? Or at what stage should you have a dedicated person? Yeah, so I, I think that if you do a good job from the beginning of kind of layering security and getting everybody to understand that security is their responsibility regardless of your role, you don't necessarily need a, a security person right off the bat, right? But you do need a security person eventually. Um, and I would hire somebody that's that's more of a, a senior level person that has has good product security experience from external and bring them in and then start using your internal resources, your engineers that are passionate, bring them over to help support that product security team. And then you can do, it's kind of like a three tier process, right? Build out your internal security team, then you can start with a vulnerability disclosure program, roll that into a paid bug bounty program, because with that you get a team of security researchers, hackers, yeah. that are essentially supplementing your product security team, um, and then you pay them for their findings. And then the third part of that, and the very last component, is to bring in an external team to do a pen test, maybe annually, and this is to help you with your compliance checkboxes. Yeah, and coverage. Yeah. yeah. Cool. My final question to you, what have you seen in the world is the best initiative to make cybersecurity a topic for everybody in the world? <laughs> Has it been done yet? I don't know. <laughs> it could be a proposal for yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I think um, I'd say it's a really hard question. I, like, do you have any it, it, on top it of your head? It is a tough question. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I feel like we're getting there slowly yeah. but surely. Yeah. Um, I, could there be more? Of course. Yeah. There could I think there's be a more. lot of things happening. Like g getting vulnerabilities into the mass media is like a really good thing to actually get it up into the discussion. And also, like looking at frameworks popping up, being secure from the start is like a, a way of that happening. But we're not there yet, I think. Yeah. Not yet. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Franz. Thank, Thank you, you, audience. Thank you.